Hey, I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, March 7th, 2020. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. We kind of break the rules here for Native Radio. We don't do prayers and we don't do Buffalo speeches. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity. Uh, we may step on a few toes along the way, but our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We'll take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us, and we do it all right here, live from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But first, let me remind people that our audio streams live on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. We stream live video of the show via Facebook Live on various Facebook group pages, including the Facebook group page for this show. Uh, we take the audio, we put it up on SoundCloud, which puts it out as a podcast on all your, your favorite podcast platforms. We take the video, we put it up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. I encourage you to subscribe to our podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, you'll get a chance to check out not only these shows, but the show I do in New York and uh, our short form videos that we do uh, there as well. Uh, I am the show's host and producer. I'm joined here in studio by Jake Proud, who's managing our audio and our video. All right, let me let me get right into it. Um, the topic is the state of Native American or Native education. I think it's not American. Native education. Uh, that American thing is the part of the problem. <laughs> um, so how much should we, how much do we allow the state to dictate educational standards on our territories? I mean, look, here in, in Seneca Territory, uh, our kids go to the public schools. In fact, our kids are spread out into three separate school districts where they, even when there's a, you know, a, a significant Native population in these schools, our kids are still, you know, divided up so that we are the minority. Our kids are the minority in these schools. Um, we can get into a whole debate about the effectiveness of public education in the United States. We certainly can have a, a conversation about the effectiveness of public education in Western New York, in, in these school districts in particular. We can have a conversation about the success rate of Native kids in these school districts. We can look at the bigger picture on how um, uh, what the dropout rate is, what is the uh, the rate of uh, kids not only graduating, but um, going into secondary education. There's a lot of things we can talk about. And none of the numbers are great. I mean, not just great for your, and they're not just bad for native kids. I mean, the, the I mean, I, I saw some of the numbers for, for Buffalo and they said the Buffalo school district, they're paying somewhere between 20 and $30,000 per student. If you break it down per enrolled student in their, in the school district, and their numbers are dismal. It is, it's, it's ranked among the worst, not only in New York State, but in the United States. And this is like New York, right? This is supposed to be the, the bastion of, you know, of, uh, you know, liberal arts and, you know, liberal thinking and pro being progressive and all that other stuff. Well, not so much. So when we do take it upon ourselves to, to create our own schools, whether they are, you know, um, immersion programs, native schools that way, or whether they're just schools that we assert a little bit more control. Where's that line between the role the states play? In New York State here in particular, but in other places as well. I mean, I know we have schools in, in some of the other territories. Those schools oftentimes that, that are run uh, by, uh, you know, by the, the people within those communities are usually the smaller segment of our kids that are being populated compared to the public schools outside. So how much do we allow the states, New York State in this case, to dictate what the curricula is, what the curriculum, you know, what, what are and what the standards are? Because they, when I look at what I oftentimes have to address with and have addressed with my own kids or, and now my grandkids, I feel like I've got to talk about some of the things that are, they're being taught. I feel like I got to address what they're being taught, not only in terms of history, but Perhaps even some of the other stuff. I mean, uh, you know, um, they have. When I was a kid, they call it social studies, but now they call it global studies. They 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 have civics. They they talk about you know politics. You know uh, politics. So it's not just history. It's current affairs and and understanding where we fit in this stuff. They're, they teach about you know try to teach about government and law and that kind of thing. But they always offer it from a from a very very Eurocentric American uh, U.S. centric perspective. Not a whole lot of critical thinking there. And, and that's the problem with a lot of education is that there, it is being taught 
as you know, oftentimes as if the facts are the facts and that there's that that too much is not open to um uh to perspective or, or conversation and i you know and look we can we can say that some schools are are becoming a little bit more open minded about some some stuff i mean look we the school districts around here have a you know some level of native programming you know programs in in the schools but is it enough so if we were to in some of our territories take a much bigger role in the education of our kids whether it's through schools on our territories that begin to have more a more a significant enrol enrollment of our of our, uh, of our kids how much do we have what's what's that fight like back the pushback to, to new york state you know or, or any state to say no we're not going to use your curricula as it relates to things like history or or the, some of the things that are, are tied to to social development I, I, because you know look we can we can teach math uh in an effective way we can teach you know science in an effective way but even science i mean a lot of that stuff is skewed in, in terms of where you know where science has been advanced you know, i'm not look i'm not gonna say we've got to you know turn science into you know a propaganda advancing our people but let's let's be honest of where uh where some you know, where some development has been not just you know uh humanities in terms of develop, development on the humanities but development on on, on some techno technological issues so i think there's there, there are different ways to to approach this stuff but the question is what if new york state doesn't approve um the manner in which we we teach our kids now i know there's there's other questions we can we can talk about well look if we take that education on will, will our kids be prepared would, would they would the standard be high enough to um uh you know, so our kids are not deprived of education. Well, look, I understand <laughs> that that concern, but if you measure it against the success our kids are having in these these public schools already, I don't think it's that big a lift uh, to to give our kids a better chance. So, and I'm not saying that we should be marginalized or marginally better um, in at, or in our success rate with educating our kids in our schools versus the public schools around our territory. And look, and I'm not attacking the local public schools. I'm not attacking them specifically. I, I hold, at some level, the state's a little bit more accountable because they try to come up with the, the state testing, uh, um, the state standards, um, and and so much uh, so many other things that that I think sometimes the the schools the, even the, the local public schools they have their hands tied to a certain extent. I mean, look, we got quality t teacher issues and that kind of stuff, but we also have, from a native pr perspective, what do our kids see? Do they see a teacher that looks like them? Do they see? Do they see? I mean, even on, on the sports teams, for instance. I mean, because look, part of school is, is a social interaction. I'm going to talk a little bit more of that uh, as we go forward with, with the program. Uh, you know, are our kids still experiencing racism in these schools? I mean, and, and let's be honest. We, you know, some of that racism can manifest itself in native mascots, not just that the, 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 for the schools that our kids attend. <laughs> the Salamanca are still the Warriors. Uh, but it's also manifested in the schools that we have, um, you know, athletic competition against. So we know that the racism there. And and look, when, when my kids were going to school, we had some racism issues. We had commentary that was offered by certain teachers or, or, or coaches anyway towards Native kids. So it's still there. I mean, and, and, and of course, when you look at um, disciplinary issues, you know, I know there's a lot of studies that are talk about how how black students are suspended, you know, at a much higher rate, disproportionate to their population and all that other stuff um, in, in a lot of public schools. And I would I would contend that native kids experience some of that same stuff. And of course, look, part of the reason for our kids performing poorly in in these schools is not just because they are somehow culturally um, problematic. But, you know, look, we have we have home issues. So I mean, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to blame the schools, per se. Nor am I trying to put all the blame on parenting. There's a lot of social um, degradation that has taken place, and historical trauma that 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 have affected not just the, the current kids that are in school, but their parents and their grandparents. And and let's let's be clear, some of that 
intergenerational trauma was tied to educational institutions, residential schools and the like. So there are some issues at play here. And, you, and the idea that, that they don't even teach about residential schools in the schools is, you know, it, there's no other way to describe it except for you know, as, as a cover up. You know, so even as they talk about truth and reconciliation on, you know, on the Canadian side, and that's not even a conversation on the, uh, you know, on, on the U.S. side. But even as they're having some of that conversation, um, it doesn't enter into the, the curriculum, into the, into the discussions in schools. You know, and, and look, even when we're talking about literature, you know, when, how, many, how many Native uh, writers um, ever, even for our kids, it's not, you know, there's not even offered up, you know, a, a native authors, you know, to, uh, to, to the literature programs and that kind of thing. So, look, there are some, some cultural biases that our kids are being educated, you know, within. And, and so that's a problem. But again, if we step up, if we start to take, and, and, and look, this, the Seneca Nation um, actually launched at least some exploratory, um, um, you know, program towards towards doing this they hired a schoolmaster for a year or two i don't know a head schoolmaster paid him a lot of money too by the way but it was also he wasn't native either so um and i'm not saying that that, that you know everything has to be um homegrown in terms of how we educate i think i think we have to have standards that that meet you know the the rest of the world and not just because we have to educate our kids to go to college. I'm not even saying that, that that's the, the function here, because I think that may be part of the problem. You know, if, if the only kids who get um, attention in, in a high school are the kids that, are, that demonstrate some, some worthiness towards, uh, towards a college-bound education, then what about the kids, the vast majority of kids who are not going to go to college or the ones who do go to college who are still going to struggle every day because the, the economy is changing and, that, and that, that college degree, that you know, two years associate's degree doesn't, ha doesn't mean what it used to mean. So there's a lot of these conversations. You know, I've talked before about how we don't, even as we're measuring success, since we always measure it by, um, by income, we don't think about where quality of life. Do we educate uh, um, the, these generations and the future generations of, of kids towards pursuing um, a higher standard of life that is not necessarily measured or bound by, by dollars and cents? I mean, that's the conversation. Now, and this sounds like a hypothetical uh, question. And, and look, on some levels it is. And, but our kids are experiencing, look, we went through battles on whether a kid can even wear an eagle feather on a, on a, when they do graduate. Can they wear an eagle feather on their cap and gown? Now we're seeing the envelope being pushed farther. We've got kids that are, that are, using, that are dressing in, in native, uh, native clothing, uh, regalia, if you will. So there's a lot more that, that's going on, ribbon shirts and that kind of thing. So we're, we are breaking some of that stuff. But, but again, our, our kids are, are, are very much... In the minority, on uh, in in terms of not just the um, uh, uh, the enrollment, the the, the student po uh, population, but they're also not very represented in in terms of the alumni and, and the uh, and the faculty and the staff. So it is problematic. But um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this isn't just a hypothetical question about about if we school our kids. Um, I don't think Seneca Nation is even close, and, and probably many other communities aren't close to, to really developing a full service, you know, school K through twelve, or, or even a portion of it. Um, but there is an, a conversation that's been growing about homeschooling, and and I have some issues with homeschooling. I think the problem, one of the among the problems with school, homeschooling, is the the social uh, interaction issue. And even though some of our kids, the social interaction isn't all that it could be, but at least it, it, it prepares them a little bit for the, for the social interaction beyond school. I mean, the societal issues are, are a big part of going to school. How you, you know, not just the co-curricular activity, sports and, and some of the other things that, that, a, that an institution can offer, which homeschool wouldn't necessarily offer. Um, so I, it, it, it does concern me. And of course... When we talk about homeschooling, is there a standard 
that homeschooling should strive to achieve and who determines that standard? Because here's the problem. <laughs> you have an awful lot of state agencies that are invested or in partnership with, uh, with public schools uh, or, or, or even private schools. You have like, you know, CPS, Child Protective Services. There's a close relationship between CPS and, uh, and schools. You know, many of the CPS complaints that, uh, you know, are, that are received come from schools. And I'm not, you know, I'm, look, I'm not criticizing the whole thing. I'm, look, if, you, if a kid comes to school and they're bruised up, you know, should they be checked out? If they've got, you know, chronic health or, or you know, or nutrition problems or, you know, hygiene issues. I mean, I, I get it. But that's the state relationship with, with a state-funded school. So what does it look like if we're homeschooling? And, you know, and do, um, do native governing structures, the Seneca Nation, for instance, are they prepared to uh, have some role in, in asserting a standard or, and I'm not even saying testing, I'm just saying some sort of standard. I mean, it, it's, it's problematic. Because here's the thing, I could see CPS trying to intervene with, with somebody who's homeschooled. And, and this, again, this isn't a hypothetical situation. This is a conversation that's happening here in Seneca Nation territory right now. I'm not, I didn't talk to any of the players in this, so I'm not going to mention any names. So I'm not trying to be cryptic or secretive. And, and perhaps um, uh, a future show, I will have a guest on who is going through some of this and maybe even somebody from Seneca Nation to, to talk about this. I mean, just look, where, however you feel about this, it's still a conversation that needs to be had. And I think people have to think about this because again, our kids are not being, our, our kids are not being, sorry for punching the microphone there. <laughs> our kids are not being served that well, um, statistically in public schools. No, they aren't. I mean, uh, and, and public schools statistically aren't, aren't doing that well. I mean, if you measure you know, um, uh, the, the education in the United States in general across, uh, you know, against other countries, eh, it's, it's not that good. It's not that good. And, and, and let's, let's be honest. Part of the thing is that schools have become child care centers. And, and, and maybe it was inevitable that it was going to be that way. But you, you not only have kids who, you know, by going to school, you know, allow the parents to, you know, to not have to pay for child care during that period of time. In fact, you know, as this coronavirus thing uh, has in, has shut a bunch of schools down, part of the concern is when these schools shut down and you have kids who have been on free or reduced lunches, some of those kids, that's the best meal of the day they're getting. And look, I'm not propping up, uh, you know, the cafeteria lady necessarily. Sorry, I shouldn't have made that a gender thing. I'm not, I'm not propping up cafeteria food necessarily. But nutritionally, there's a good chance that some of these kids are, that's among their best. And, and some of these schools do breakfast too, not just lunch. So if, if a school shuts down, uh, though you know you are depriving kids of you know probably at least a meal or two a day. So I mean, th there's a lot of reasons that that this that there's this relationship between child protective services and uh, and schools. And you know what? It's not just CPS uh, by themselves. They utilize the court systems. What about kids? you know, um, who are being, you know, uh, pulled, uh, uh, pulled apart by, you know, parent, you know, and child custody issues. Will a parent who's homeschooling their kids, who doesn't have the seal of approval from the state, get embroiled in, in, in uh, are they in a weakened custody battle uh, circumstance? See, these are the conversations that we need to have. I mean, I, look, I'm going to flat out tell you, I'm all for Native people, Native territories, and Native parents playing a more active role in, in our kids' education. Now, sure, one, one of the ways to do that is by homeschooling, but there's some downside to it. The, you know, one, of the, one of the other ways is to, to address it is, is to do some cooperative schooling. Maybe you, you build a bit of a, of, a, of a group of people who you know, work together to homeschool our kids, or you build a school. Or you push harder in the public schools, which is kind of the way things have been going. There's been a lot more pushback in the public schools to make sure that, that there is more diverse um, subject material being addressed in these schools. But is it enough? And is it enough when you consider the fact that our kids go from being uh, from, from 
you know, four years old up until the age of four being on our territory where this is their exposure to all of a sudden being thrown up into institutions where they're automatically in a minority uh, situation, not just because color of skin, but culturally. And <laughs> there's, there's schools that are probably already looking at Native kids as, as the kids who have a bigger, uh, you know, a bigger hurdle to climb to get over. Uh, you know, so there's a certain amount of, uh, what, what do they call it, uh, profiling, you know, that, that happens even with kids. And there's an assumption. There's an assumption that uh, every kid, you know, who every native kid in a school has some sort of, may have some domestic issues going on. And of course, it's not true, but some of it's true. So this is a very, very complicated issue. And it's one that we're somewhat hesitant to have. And I know, I, I, I know people who are commenting on, on Facebook, are like, oh, hell no, the state should have no role. And look, I, I get that. I get that, and I'm not happy with our relationship with, certainly not with New York State, um, on many issues, but including, you know, about fairness to our, you know, to our children. And again, we have a legacy of schools being utilized uh, to assimilate our kids. And you know what? They're still being used that way. Our kids are taught to pledge allegiance to the flag, first damn thing. They're taught to memorize the Star Spangled Banner, first damn thing. They're taught about all these American heroes, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. But they're not taught truth. They're not taught, they, they aren't told what Ronda de Gaius means. So, you know, our kids are, are being taught in these schools that these American, these iconic American figures are, are heroes. And, and let's face it, education is, is a propaganda tool. I mean, and, and that's not like a, a conspiracy theory. There is no question that schools ha have been an integral part of, uh, of promoting patriotism among children. I mean, that's why you, I mean, think about the absurdity of getting a four or five year old to pledge allegiance to the flag and, and to, and to the, and to the Republic for which it stands. I mean, Look, that sounds like, you know, almost, that's got a little bit of Nazi-esque, you know, you know, feeling to it. You know, the idea of, you know, propagandizing children early on. I, I know that's, look, that sounds like an anti-American thing to say. Well, maybe it is. But that's the way, I mean, and he, again, even, even the literature that is taught. I mean, I think about one of the schools that, one of the books that we were uh, read in school was Lord of the Flies. And you couldn't help but, but read that book. And know that in many ways it was trying to make a mockery of native people. It was reducing these little white kids to to being tribal. <laughs> but that's not the way the, the book is um, uh, is promoted, really. So, I mean, it, it's almost like well, these kids regressed. You know, and, and again, if you don't know the book, you don't know the book. But I mean, I'm just so I, I mean, even even looking back at my own education and look. I got a decent education, you know, and I went to public school. But but you know what? I was I was a kid who did, who did well in in those scenarios, and I tested well, and you know, and I scored high on SATs and, and all that other stuff. But I but, but at an early age, I was a critical thinker. And look, that that idea of being a critical thinker can also can can be met with resistance by uh, by faculty. John Cain's a smart ass. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> that was said. That kid's kind of arrogant. Yeah, or or he's obnoxious. Yeah, these are the kind of things. And you know what? I was probably all three of those things because <laughs> I'm kind of that way today. But the idea that I was trying to you know provide critical thought and maybe some a certain level of, of argumentativeness should have been embraced. I mean, let's let's debate the subjects. You know, and look, and I wasn't stifled in school, you know, and, and, and look, I'll, uh, look, I'm not propping myself. I'm not trying to boast myself up, but, but I was popular in school. So, and, but I was pretty, you know, I was pretty sure of myself as well, but not all kids are, and I went to a school where I was the only native family in the school for, through most of my, you know, my family was the only native school or uh, native kid. And there were hardly any other kids of color. I think there was one Pakistani kid. 
And maybe that was it. I mean, I don't think there was – in my whole school. So it was – that was kind of a strange thing. So, I mean, that's – when when you when you see everybody looks different than you, or is different than you, and maybe it's not just about looks. I mean, because yeah, I, I could white pass, I could cut my hair down short, and and you know, when, when I grew up, most kids knew I was I was the native kid in school, but it wasn't you know in their face kind of thing. I also went to a school that was called the Cambridge Indians, <laughs> so you end up being the, the token uh, the, the token Cambridge Indian, right? But no, I, this is this is a conversation that more of, more of us need to have. And, and I'll tell you, we're going we're to take a break here we're at the bottom of the hour. But when I come back, I want to talk a little bit about how I've heard this conversation is manifesting in terms of an individual, a, a mother who is looking at homeschooling her kids and her trying to go to the Seneca Nation to get some backup to provide some pushback to the state. We'll, you know, and that's going to that's gonna play out. And, and like I said, we'll do a future show. But look, I, I wanted to, to address this, this this conversation, at least get this in people's minds. So when we do a future show on the subject, people will already maybe, you know, run this through their heads a little bit. So we'll do that when we come back. Uh, at the bottom of the hour, we'll take a break. I'm John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane, and uh, this is Let's Talk Native. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank um, uh, Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses. I want to thank Eric White and ERW Enterprises. I want to thank the folks at Grand River Enterprises and the folks at Cat Res Smoke and Gas Shops. Um, yeah, so you know, back on topic here, talking about what pushback and 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 at what level do we interact with with the state here like in New York state because there is there are implications there there are you know standards that the state will uh, assert and and this becomes a jurisdictional battle does new york state have jurisdiction over our children i know that seems sounds like a simple it sounds like a simple question and a simple answer but trust me it's more complicated than that and and it shouldn't be but it is and even if they don't have jurisdiction, how much, how should that relation, what should that relationship look like? Should we um, take, you know, take some guidance from the state? Should we look at their standards and say, oh, we're not just going to, we'll meet those? Or should we say, we'll look at your standards and we're going to go above them? I mean, that would, to me would be much better if we said, look, I, I get what your, what your, your standards are and your, what your standard testing is. And we're not satisfied being, you know, just passing that test. We, we have a higher standard. Then, then how do you get there? Well, and, and, I, and I will say there is something to the whole self-esteem building part of it. And I'm not saying that homeschooling is the solution to that. But I think having a stronger native presence in our educational system would do a lot to, uh, for self-esteem building. You know, it's funny. I look at the three school districts here, and I, and I can't really speak for Salamanca because I, I'm not as familiar with the, with the kids there. But um, our the schools up here, athletically, on, on on almost any given team, it's native kids that are uh, that are uh, form the, the the strength of those teams: basketball, lacrosse, football. You know, uh, I'm not so sure about baseball anymore. Used to be, used to be, and. Our kids are divided into three schools. They're not, they're not all playing together. If we had our own school, I think we'd have some kick-ass kick sports teams uh, in, in all the major sports. I guarantee it. You know, uh, softball, baseball, lacrosse, girls and boys, basketball, girls and boys. No, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, we would have some, uh, you know, if, if we, you brought the, the entire population of kids here in, into one sports program, and I'm not saying that, that that should be the priority, but we do know that athletics is one of those areas that, you know, when we talk about the things we try to do to, you know, um, you know, teach 
our kids, you know, and uh, and mold character and that kind of stuff. You know, we, we look for things like sports. Not that sports should be the only thing. There should be other things too. But I, I, again, we get separated into, into the school districts where where they there's a lot of indoctrination that goes there. I mean, even even a simple thing I've talked about before. I mean, the the, the schools end up being the place that they try to get our 18 year old boys to to register for the draft. Sometimes without without the parents aren't even involved in the process. Well, they're 18; they don't need to be. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the conversation that's being being had. So I mean, this is again. There's there's a lot of reasons that you know where where the schools play a significant role in either um, doing a certain amount of crushing of our of self esteem, but certainly not being uh, uh, providing the, the you know an atmosphere for the diverse uh, education that our kids should be getting. So when we take some of that back and we we do provide even if it's schooling outside of you know uh, the the public school which you know which is somewhat problematic because you know, look our kids are spending enough time in an institution and and they get the first crack at it right the the, the you know the, the the public schools get the first crack at trying to influence our kids you know I, I, at the beginning of the school year I, I did a show and i said you know where is that line i mean how much do we debrief our kids every day to say well what did they teach you today and, and in our minds, say, what, do we, what did they teach you that we got to unteach you today? And look, and we can always get hyped up about it over certain subjects. Then we, then we go to sleep on it for a while. I mean, American politics is a perfect example. Oh, the, the, the power of the vote, the importance of the U.S. Constitution, civil rights. Human rights aren't, aren't talked about as much as civil rights in, uh, in schools. And that's somewhat problematic. And, and I'll tell you. When they do teach na about, to the extent that, that Native issues are addressed in school, they're always addressed as if we were in the past. The well, Iroquois studies are not about burning tires on the thruway. And they should be. The, the Iroquois studies are not about the state trying to take another billion dollars out of the, uh, out of the Seneca Nation's gaming enterprises. But they should be. Iroquois studies isn't about how the Senecas got screwed, you know, for, uh, by the state when they put the throughway through, or when they put rail through, or when they put anything else through. But it should be. Instead, they, they're going to say, "Well, let's teach you about what the what the Iroquois were like. We're going to teach you about, you know, the the, the systems and and the the societies, Iroquois societies, and they're going to teach it as if they're taking a, a snapshot of something two hundred years ago. Oh, let's teach you about the Iroquois Confederacy." Well, how about we teach about where we are now? You know, if we're going to teach about what was so great about our, our longhouse culture, then why did it get run over? Why did it stop? And let's not pretend that it didn't stop. We're, we're, you know, Masonic Nation isn't exactly operating in the clan system here. So we're going to teach about history, but we're not going to teach about how, the, how it came to be the Seneca Nation um, abandoned the clan system. Of course we aren't. That's that's not even going to be addressed. And, and I'll tell you, and if it was addressed, it would be a highly controversial subject <laughs> because it's hard to get it's hard to get two uh, native people in the room together and agree uh, on, on how things got went bad. Look, I know we do some language programs and, th and that's great. But if you separate the language from the culture. So if you don't if you if you're only going to teach vocabulary and not teach etymology about how we as a people uh, learned how to identify, you know, certain, you know, parts of our culture with, through the language. You know, I oftentimes explain that many native languages are, are more verb based or descriptive based than, than, uh, than labels and noun based. So it isn't just about this and that and the other thing. It's about what happens with these things, right? So we describe something not by giving it, assigning it a label, but, but we describe something, we, we give it a, a, a an, we, exp, we express what a, an object is by what it does. So, I mean, it's, it's just a different way. So if that's the way our language is, then wouldn't that change the entire edu educational system? All right, so like I said, 
this isn't just a hypothetical question. There is, there's a, a, a young woman, and I've known her since she was a kid. Um, she grew up with my kids, who wants to homeschool school her kids. And she's a, I don't want to misrepresent this, but I think she's a single mother raising kids herself. And she wants to homeschool her kids. And she's got, you know, a, a pretty good background in terms of some language skills and, and you know, some, she, I mean, she knows a bit, you know, a bit about native culture and that kind of thing. And, and she may even even work in some of the education system, from what I understand. I, I don't don't know for that for sure. But she she wants to homeschool her kids, and she's looking to the Seneca Nation to provide her some backup, as she might may have to push back against the state trying to um, dictate how and what she you know, how she educates her kids and what she what she teaches them. So this isn't a hypothetical question it's a it's a real circumstance that is that is beginning to play out and and from what i understand you you would think that she would have gotten you know on the face of it like i said i see the comments on facebook everybody's oh hell no state no state no state no well and i'm not just saying this because i think some of the counselors are are sellouts or not but but there was pushback and and some might say legitimate pushback but it's not, again, this isn't as simple a subject as what people think it is. Clearly, the Seneca Nation, they've had an education department for years. And they've even looked at the possibility of doing uh, a Seneca school. And, and, and actually, they do have a certain level of, they, they have ECLC. So they do the pre-K and they do summer programs, educational programs. So it's not like the Seneca Nation doesn't have a place in the education of our kids, they do, you know, they do tutoring and, you know, they, they have the JOM program and, you know, a few other things. But the Santa Nation doesn't have a school that goes beyond, you know, age four. So what is that, you know, so what should the Santa Nation do? And I'll tell you, part of the reason that we should have this conversation is because you have to tell your, the, your public servants what your views are on this thing. And even if, and, and it may be part of their job to give a little bit of pushback, not, not to take the state's side on this thing, but saying, look, if we're going to you know, provide this young mother or anybody with some cover against the state, then how do we know that, you know, how do we measure whether a kid is getting an ad adequate education? And this is problematic too, because if we only use the standard if we only use the state standard, we don't have any other way of measuring um, the success, you know, of whether it's homeschooling or, you know, or native schooling. If we're only going to measure it by a state test or an SAT score, you know, I'm, I've been one that's talked about. We, we need to educate our kids for, for a higher standard of living, for a better quality of life, not just for making more money. And I know some people have a hard time separating those issues. But we shouldn't. We shouldn't have a hard time separating. We should understand. Look, and I've said this before. I've listened to some of the ad advertisements for, for colleges across the country. And almost every one of them, even the ones that are tied to like, you know, Jesuit colleges and so like every one of them uses a similar tagline, preparing our young people for the global economy. <laughs> well, what about the local economy? What about the things that really, you know, impact us on a daily basis and and how do we if we're going to talk about economy one of the problems with the global economy is the global economy has you know, there's a giant sucking sound where money gets sucked out of some regions and then land in, in the pockets of very few and i know it's capitalism it's all of that but there's also things like targeting targeted marketing and that kind of stuff when you look at the spending habits of people look what the, what we all buy the same, we all fulfill the same needs with our purchases. But who gets that money? Is it Walmart? Is it Amazon? Is it, you know, are they, is it a franchise that isn't necessarily keeping money in the community for any length of time? Look, I've talked about this when it came to gaming, but let's, let's talk about this as it relates to um, economy building. And if we don't educate our kids early on about the value of, uh, of having local interaction, not just on territory, but first on territory, 
And then how do we have, you know, a, a more regional approach to, um, to raising our standard of living? If, you know, this, is, this isn't being taught. I mean, these aren't the standards that are being taught. I mean, and again, part of the problem that, that I see in terms of how, you know, uh, uh, propagandizing public schools are, it plays right into the romanticizing of, of war. Like I said, schools have a lot of recruiters in there. I mean, it was about a bunch of pushback when, when certain colleges said, no, we're not going to let an ROTC program in here. But schools have recruiter, recruiters that come in. They don't, when they have career days, they're, they're promoting things like, like, like enlisting in the armed forces. Not only do the schools play a role in registering our 18-year-old boys for the draft, but it's, it's more than that. And, of course, the way history is taught. You know, I, I, one of the things I'm, I'm all, I always bring up as, as a perfect example is when we talk about ro the romanticizing of war or death and destruction uh, associated with it, look, it's fine to talk about Nuremberg trials and prosecuting the Nazis for war crimes. But the United States dropped two nuclear weapons on a very, on a much, much smaller country that was on its knees already because of other bombing that had taken place on Japan. The United States dropped, dropped two nuclear weapons on, on a small island country. Civilian targets, no less. If we are not going to teach our kids that, but you know, that's unpatriotic to teach it that way. So this is, this is the challenge, folks. And so I'm having this conversation tonight, and I hope that you have this conversation. And look, you, you don't have to mention my name. <laughs> don't, you don't have to mention that you, that you heard it on my show. But this is a conversation that we all need to have. You know, and, and look, I'm, I'm not a parent anymore. I'm a grandparent. And, but, and I sometimes I'm, I'm pretty conflicted because I also don't want to step all over my, my kids as they're raising their kids either. But... I'm going to have some of these tough conversations with, with, uh, with the kids. And, and, they're, they've, and the hard part is because it's only going to be a conversation with grandpa. And then they go to school and they have to figure out, well, how do I address what I'm being taught here? Uh, you, know, you know, juxtaposed against what my grandfather just taught me. I mean, I know what he said is true, but... How do I even bring that up into a conversation where I'm the only person bringing something like this up? I mean, how do I even do that? You know, and, and of course, the flip side of it is if we have our own school, if we're homeschooling our kids, how do, I, how do we teach our kids not to hate? Because I'll tell you, when you tell someone the truth of history, it's pretty freaking ugly. I mean, you tell the truth about, about slavery, about lynching, about Tulsa, about the Osage, the Osage murders, the massacres, the scalpings, the, the bounties, the largest mass execution in the history of the United States at the hands of Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, and then, so, and then when our kids go to a ball game and they're asked to stand and, and pledge allegiance to the flag, and if they take a knee like Colin Kaepernick or just sit like Colin Kaepernick was doing before he took a knee, how do, how do you address that? Look, my, my friends in, in Hawaii, there's a school called the Kamehameha School whose foundation is tied to, to making sure that the, the, the Hawaiian culture is taught to their kids. And a whole row of them refuse to stand for the national anthem. At their commencement ceremony. I mean, and rather than questioning why is there, why are they playing the, the U.S. national anthem, a country who stole and illegally occupied their their, their lands, in in a school called the Kamehameha School, instead of even addressing that issue, school administrators are saying those kids will be punished for what they did. And look, I'm glad, but a bunch of Hawaiian parents pushed back, and they pushed back hard. My question would be, look, if we played an honor song at a sporting event, would all the white people stand? I, I, some of them would. 
Yeah, I think they would. I don't have a problem with being somewhat reciprocating in terms of, you know, respecting somebody else's culture. But it's not reciprocated. So if we do teach our kids to, to have a little bit of fight in them as they're being indoctrinated or, or, or as the attempt, attempts at indoctrination come through, I mean, look, even school government is somewhat indoctrinating. You know, the student council. They aren't set up like clans, I guarantee you that. <laughs> so these are some of the challenges. And, and, and like I said, it's not just hypothetical. Even though there, you know, there's always an ongoing conversation about the role that we play in creating our own educational institutions, you got to ask the question, well, what about the, in the absence of those educational institutions? How do we support perhaps you know, a family that wants to homeschool or, or a, maybe a, a collective of families that want to homeschool? How do, how do we as a community, not just the Seneca Nation, I'm not talking about just 16 counselors and a president, but in each, each of our communities, what do we do to help, support, or maybe even provide something? Not that it's always necessarily going to be welcome. Because that's, the, you know, see, this is the other part of it. Do, if we believe as, as consistent with our culture, because it's not just the African proverb that takes a, a, a village to raise a child. No, that, that's something that's, that, that, you know, look, we see that in our marriage ceremonies and everything else, the role that, that the community has in terms of family. We've moved away from that. We, we've, we've so much configured, assimilated to this notion of nuclear family that we don't seem to have a sense of responsibility to the children. We, we, we pretend that what happens in one household is only the responsibility of the parent. Th that those children are their property. Not that they are all of our futures. So, and again, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to take children away from parents. But we don't share the responsibility of that. So when we talk about things like standards, even in homeschooling, where does the rest of the community fit into, into that? I know these are tough questions, and and I know <laughs> people can say, "Oh, the freaking John Qu John Cain, he asks those questions, but he sure doesn't have any answers." <laughs> well, I, I, you know, you're right, I don't, because I don't think it's these answers aren't they're not simple questions, and they sure as hell aren't simple answers. We do need to have these conversations, and you know what? Worst case scenario, we're probably not going to do any worse than than the outside schools are doing to, for our kids anyway. We, again, do the numbers. Run the numbers. I mean, look, the Seneca Nation can do studies on, uh, on economic impact. Somebody should do a, a, an independent, you know, or, you know, independent from the state anyway. Let some of these native, native territories do their assessments on, on grade scores, education, or graduation rates, you know, disciplinary issues performance you know uh, you know states you know uh performance standards when do we do some of that and so when we have those numbers that are our numbers that we work out from from our own research because only until we have those numbers can we say we can do better i mean we can generally say we can do better but how do we know if we're only relying on their numbers and their numbers aren't very good <laughs> i mean when the, when the state's evaluating these school districts or whatever else When do we, when do we evaluate what our children are going through? And, and that's the crazy part. We have a right to, because our children and our grandchildren are going to these schools. And many of us are saying, we don't have a choice. And why is that? Well, part of it is because the state mandates it. The state, you don't, you don't send your, your parents, you know, look, again, I, I understand part of the reason. Schools can actually can can actually bring you know charges against parents if they don't allow their kids to be educated. Courts can do that. So, what about for us? 
what's what's the standard and and what what is the oversight who provides it who enforces it complicated question i mean i look we can we can give all kinds of answers but they aren't necessarily right answers so so again this is part of the issue so i mean I, again i think this is a conversation we need to have look i know we're, we're almost out of time here so this is something i want to talk about a little bit because I, this coronavirus issue is something that's beginning to impact you know, a lot of people. I go to New York each week to do a show, and I'm left questioning how much longer do I keep traveling to New York City? Because I got I to gotta factor in a few things. I'm on a train, so I'm on mass transit. Eh, not the best place to be for you know the spread of infectious disease. I'm on a train for eight hours to New York. I spend a couple of hours on a subway, you know, going to my studio and from my studio. And then I'm, you know, almost eight hours on a bus. Those three, you know, mass transit and, and public transit situations are not conducive to, uh, to, to stifling the spread of disease. Now, I'm not even that concerned about myself. You know, not because I think I'm bulletproof or invisible or anything else, but I, I think I'm healthy enough that if I did, I think I would survive the coronavirus. <clears throat> but I have I have loved ones that that I have to worry about um, infecting if I if, even if I were just to merely carry it. So I'm not I'm start I'm still trying to work this thing out. Uh, this week in, in in New York, my my co-host was going to join me from Austin, Texas, because she was going down to, to speak at a conference that was you know, connected to the, to the South by Southwest um, festival that's, that starts uh, next week. I don't know if she's still going or not because it was canceled. This is a major, a major public event in Austin, Texas that draws people not only from all over the country, but from, frankly, all over the world. It's a, it's a music and arts festival. It's a film festival. It's, it's all of these things. It's a, it's a huge social event. And Austin, Texas, which hasn't exactly been ground zero for coronavirus, canceled it. Um, I am involved in some other events that are coming up that I've got to you know, question whether these things are going to happen. You know, especially, you know, if they're based in, in, at a university. And I don't want to, you know, speculate about events that I'm, at this point, events that I'm doing that, that may cancel, that I don't have control over. Because if they're being done at a university, don't know if the if universities are going to allow them. This is kind of a real thing here. Whatever, whatever you believe about where it came from or who is or isn't responsible for it, regardless of any of that stuff, there, there are people getting sick, and you know, I know that the um, the numbers in in the New York City area have raised. It's approaching eighty people by tomorrow. We'll probably, I think, seventy seven was not the number we just heard. Seventy seven um, people infected. Um, you know, in, in places like Washington State, they've had. That's where most of the deaths have occurred. You know, and I got to tell you, I'm not in that sweet spot as far as <laughs> they're saying. If you're under forty nine, under forty nine years old. You're probably just going to be, you know, have flu-like symptoms and you'll probably be fine. Eh, I'm not 49 anymore. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not scared over, over it. I'm more scared about who, who else I could possibly infect, I guess. So, I'm going to make a decision between, you know, now by the time I do my show on Tuesday, I'll let you know whether I'm going to be doing my show in New York. I will be doing my Thursday show, my New York show on Thursdays. But I may be doing it from my studio here, that's all. I guess that's what I'm saying here. But I think we have to look at this thing. And from a native standpoint, we're usually on the, on the short end of the stick when it comes to, you know, um, uh, the healthcare issues that we, we face, put it that way. And I'm not saying we're on, we're on the shortest end. Look, we, we have decent healthcare, but I've looked at some other territories that have, uh, you know, that are, have, that aren't like with us here, we're in a fairly dense populated area. We're in Western New York. But I look at native territories that are more remote, and and I am I am concerned because they're pretty remote when it comes to you know you would think that would protect them from you know a pandemic, but that remoteness it becomes um, you know a liability when it comes to once the infection does get there. 
So again, I'm not trying to, you know, to hype this thing anymore. Or, you know, I'm not trying to downplay it or to or, or to hype it. But uh, I know that I'm at a place because of what I do on a weekly basis that I'm um, kind of get at that place where I've got to make some decisions about how I how I deal with it personally. So I'll let you know how that goes as we go forward. I guess. Look, I want to thank you for listening. Please do have the conversation about education. Um, it's among many of the conversations we need to have, and it's among one of the ones that I try to have here on Let's Talk Native. So thanks for joining me. Uh, we'll see you back here on Tuesday. This is John Kane, Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.